Responding to the crisis of the Depression and workers' demands, Congress passed the National Recovery Act in 1933. Although the NRA established minimum wages in many industries, management often devised ways of violating the spirit of the law and in doing so provoked increased union activity. The NRA went in and you were supposed to work X number of weeks and I still haven't looked that up and I forgot for $9 a week and then you were supposed to get $12 a week. Well, management would work you eight weeks, lay you off and rehire you as a new worker. You never got past that nine week period to get the $12 a week. And I know uh, Justin McCarty had his nephew working in the sales department, I believe. He was not in the factory as such, a bookkeeping department, I guess. And uh, he was so provoked at Justin McCarty that he lost his job with a remark he made to him. He said, why don't you just go ahead and pay these people the $12 and stand down to foot of the stairs and take it away from them when they go out. It'll save a lot of bookkeeping. And he lost his job over this. <laughs> So I presume that this would be one of the big things that really brought things to a final showdown. Magdaleno Rodriguez, he started trying to organize the people and he had a very big following. I remember my mother used to be involved in that. What he did was he organized the people, I'm assuming all over the west side, and then uh, he formed committees and each committee had their Elective, re elective representatives, he had a president, vice president, uh, secretary, and treasurer. And my mother got to be vice president of one of them. My mother was a, a very, very active person, more so than my father. It seems to me like she was always ahead of everything and getting involved in things, but my father would seem to always be there in the background, you know, not shying away from the problem, but uh, just uh, supporting her, in other words. So that is one of the reasons that I believe we really got involved, because we were always right behind Mama. We were hungry, and there was no, pl no place to, to go get a job. So the wages were so low that we had no other recourse but to go on strike. Well, the only thing I can remember is that all of a sudden there was a strike and everybody was out in the street picketing every single place where they used to shell pecans. It really was bad inside when the strike was called. Uh, the boss, with all of his pressure, and of course, needless to say, we were saying, we got to do this. And we were putting our pressure on, too, that we got a chance to do something, let's do it. So we'll lose a few weeks' work, but we'll make it up in the long run. Well, those of us who were real active uh, went down 6.30 that morning with our handbills with the general strike call. And I think a good many people, even uh, 
didn't know that they stood around in groups outside that they really didn't know whether to go in or stay out. They wanted to be with the union and they were afraid because they'd been told they'd never spend another day in a shop in Dallas and that was their home and they, they were just frightened and hungry. Cops, we had more cops around the shops and we had pickets. And of course, the cops were given liquor, and we know this for a fact, we saw it. They were, I'm sure, given extra checks to come out, and uh, they too cursed the people and said ugly things and even used their billy clubs on people, hauled us to jail. Uh, the, the, I guess the fight was bigger with the cops than it was even with management. The same companies who wouldn't pay a decent salary would haul the scabs to work in cabs. And I'm positive that a good many of those people had never been in a cab before in their life. It was a big deal. But they'd bring them in in cabs. Then the cops would line up shoulder to shoulder or hold hands and make a, an aisle for the cabs. They'd be lined up for blocks and they run them through like cattle. People were just lined up all over. Police would come and pick up. When they started putting us in jail, you know, then they would start just get people by the bunches, you know, not one or two or three, just carry them off in the van and just put us in jail. They just they used to take literally hundreds of people who were in jail. Now, I might be exaggerating, but I used to remember that people would say that the jails were so full of people that there was just no more place to put them in there. And we were, because I spent about 24 hours in there, and, uh, and there were a lot of people in there. Of course, I never knew what a jail looked like inside, and I haven't been back in one yet either. But uh, they were just people, you know, with standing room. Standing room only. Lester Larch, who was a spokesman for the Manufacturers Association, called and said that if we would call off the pickets during market week, that they would meet with us to try to come to an agreement. Well, we knew he was not sincere. We knew he was lying the way he'd always done. But we couldn't afford not to say that we cooperated. So we called off the pickets for the week. And when Mr. Pearlstein called him for an appointment, he told him to go to hell. So we had a mass picket line around his shop that morning. In other words, instead of distributing the pickets around the five or six shops, we concentrated on Lester Larch's shop. Quite by accident, uh, the police actually caused it, but all of a sudden, one of the scabs was left without any clothes on. <laughs> and the police were having a ball. But uh, we got international publicity on the so-called stripping party, because once things got started on both sides, there was a lot of people left without clothes that morning. And Lester Larch went upstairs. He made a line of uniforms, uh, nurses. I think they were nurses' uniforms, or they were white. They could have been restaurant uniforms. But anyway, they were a uniform. And he brought stacks and stacks of them down. And he'd stand inside the door and wrap them up in a uniform when they'd finally get in the door. And then I understand, uh, I can't swear this to my own knowledge, but I understand he made them pay for those uniforms <laughs> after they'd lost their own clothes trying to do get into his shop. But we'd, we'd tell Lester Larch if he'd come out and face us, we'd leave his people alone. But he never would come out the door. He later told one of our manufacturers in St. Louis that he'd rather 50 men would get a hold of him than those four women. So I think that the more the police harassed the people, the more they came out. You know, like when you run into an ant pile and you s scatter them like that, and they start coming out. 
you make them angry, <laughs> they're going to sting the heck out of you <laughs> if you don't get away. I feel that's the way we were. The more they harassed the people, you know, the, the worse the people just kept on coming from nowhere, from everywhere. That's, that's the way I see it now, the way, the way I remember it. Even if we were afraid, which I'm sure we were, which I'm sure we were afraid, because at that time, people were really afraid of police. They were really afraid of being in jail. But like I say, the worst it got, the worst they harassed the people, the people just started coming in fear or no fear, they were there. They'd thrown us all in jail. They'd throw in everybody on the picket lines. And then we were told to appear in court and show cause. And we were real surprised. There was about 125 of us who had been in jail. And when we got into Judge Town Young's court, uh, the first thing he did before there was any hearings or anything was to say that he had a, some paper on a desk in front of his uh, bench, and that anyone who would sign that paper not to go on the picket line anymore, they could go home, and they wouldn't be tried. Well, we'd had no way to be prepared for this because nobody had ever heard of such a thing before. And, of course, immediately, we kept hoping that he would call one of us. We knew that there would be some few who would do what the first person did because they hadn't had time to discuss such a move or anything, and they wouldn't know whether anybody else was going to file a suit or not. And if you didn't sign this paper, you had to go to jail for three days and nights. Well, the first person they called was a little lady that Nobody would have even been hurt if she had signed it. She had three little children at home and a sick husband. And if anyone needed to sign that paper and go home, she did. She also was a woman who had never participated in any of the activities on the picket line other than to do her picket duty. She was a quiet person who sort of stayed alone. We didn't know that much about her. She was faithful. And when they called Rachel's name, some of us, uh, I know my heart just hit the floor. I thought, well, that will cause several others to sign, because she did. And there was no doubt in my mind but what she would sign, because she needed to sign and go home. But what she did, she walked up and stood in front of that paper and said, huh. And if you were going home, you were to walk out the door. If you were to, wouldn't sign, you were to go in the judge's chambers behind the court. And she looked and she said, huh, and walked right on in all by herself. And as a result, not one single person signed that paper. What's that I hear yonder coming? What's that I hear yonder coming? What's that I hear? Coming. Well, get on board, get on board. Well, it's that union train coming. It's that union train coming. It's that union train coming. Well, get on board, get on board. And it has saved many a thousand. It has saved. Get on board.